Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD sponsored by MarketSmith. Today is July 1st, 2020. I'm your host, Arusha Pierce, and today we have Lisa Chai. Lisa is a senior research analyst at RoboGlobal. Thanks for being here, Lisa. Thanks for having me. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about the current markets, disruptive technologies, and then we will end the episode with three current ideas. So let's get into the current market. The market continues to be in a very, very strong uptrend. Uh, We have two distribution days on the NASDAQ, five on the S&P 500. So they're collecting a little bit on the S&P 500. Uh, But still, the the trend is your friend, so you want to stick with it. Lisa, what are your thoughts on, on this market? Yeah, I mean, definitely it's been an extremely volatile year so far. Um, we had the biggest sell-off in March in a long time. Um, and now we're basically recovered all of those losses. Right. Um, I think basically investors are looking ahead and looking into 2021 and beyond. Obviously, the, um, the fiscal and monetary stimulus package really helped. Um, mm-hmm. some confidence. Um, I've been really surprised, though, at how investors have really looked past and brushed off some bad news we've had. Um, right. Having some surges in coronavirus across the country. Uh, we've had some weak iPhone shipment data out, as well as uh, poor um, un- unemployment data. And auto shipments are also pretty low at the moment. But, you know, investors are overlooking that. I think they're rewarding companies that are um, building investments and building capex um, to build um, for the future. So there's lots of activity now. I think throughout the year, I think it's going to continue volatile. I don't know how sustainable some of these rallies are. Um, right. I do think that it makes sense to me that um, we are kind of moving to this new norm and what companies are going to navigate this type of environment better. And those companies tend to be in the technology sector. Um, they have a lot of cash on their balance sheet. They're much more nimble. Um, they also have very low leverage. So I think that you're seeing the IPO market slowly coming back. Um, and the buyback of all the stocks have really stopped for the time being. Um, Mm -hmm. We're also seeing some really pick up in M&A deals, which is really interesting. You got companies coming out and saying, you know what, Um, we're going to make some meaningful strategic acquisitions at this point because we have the cash to do so. So at, you know, at Robo Global right now, we're kind of scratching our heads thinking, you know, how sustainable is this rally? But we're also in a really good sweet spot where we don't really care about the near term volatility. We take a very long term view in our sector and the companies that's added to our index. Um, These companies tend to be in that disruptive technology sector, um, like cloud computing, robotics and artificial intelligence. So those are the areas where we see sort of a multi decade type of cycle that's happening. And we're very bullish on that. Perfect. So let's let's get started on how you got started and, and really uh, walk us through your path on how you ended up at Robo Global. Sure. Um, I've always been really passionate about investing in the stock market. I watched a lot of movies, read a lot of books on economics and you know fundamental analysis. Um, but I got really lucky that I'm very good with numbers. I was very good at math. Um, Mm -hmm. I went to college, I I did a double major, um, computer programming as well as finance. So, but at the time, finance is where you want to be. You want to work on Wall Street. So I was really looking to working in the finance industry with a computer programming as a backup. You know, now things are kind of reversed, right? Um, Yeah. So I was very excited. I started out as a computer programmer. Um, I had a, um, I was looking around and I interned a lot of these computer programming consulting companies and and it was a lot of fun work we did a lot of algorithm work um, at, at that point I had no idea how important that was to me as a skill set to have um, yeah. I finally found my um, dream job at a hedge fund covering technology sector and with a primarily strong focus on um, software research which was great having that computer programming skills really helped um, so after a few years of working at a hedge fund, I got to really understand how the buy side investment community worked. Moved on to private equity for a few years. That was really exciting working with startup companies covering the networking sector as well as wow. um, and a little bit of biotech. That was really cool. 
And then I moved on to the mutual fund industry, um, covering the overall broader technology sector, um, media, telecom, equipment, and also consumer sector. And that was really interesting because consumer sector as overall in the broader index was getting smaller, it was shrinking. And I got to see in the last 20 years of just figuring out how is technology and consumer and industrial markets really converging. And that's really, really cool because is Tesla an auto company or a technology right. company, right? Is it right. a consumer company or technology company? And it really depends on the kind of perspective you have and what kind of angle you're looking at. Um, I want to do something different though. I said, you know what? I see that there's a world of this index fund out there and this new ETF world. And I said, what is that? And I didn't really understand it. I got to learn a little bit more. And uh, mutual uh, contact um, introduced me to Robo Global. Mm-hmm. And I met. And, 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 and when was that around? That, that, what, was that a few years ago or longer than that? Years ago. Okay. And um, I've never heard of a global, uh, smaller company based in Dallas. And I've met with every member of the team before I joined. It was a very long process. I had, we had to make sure that our culture fit, you know? Yeah, and, exactly. And Robo Global loved my um, investment background as well as my technology background. And I love the company's um, passion and the corporate culture. Um, I found the research team to be really terrific in that they had a great kind of background expertise in the buy side and sell side research, as well as the strategic advisors were just an impressive group of thought leaders in the robotics and AI. So I said, I need to work here. And it was really exciting for me to meet everybody and get to know the story, get to know the companies, get to know the fund. And I really educated myself and how the index fund worked and we got and I joined the firm and since I joined I helped the company kind of craft um, the artificial intelligence index fund um, Mm -hmm. strategy that we just recently launched in the US um, a couple months ago but this strategy was actually took a few years in the making Um, it was very thoughtfully created uh, with all of the research members as well as the advisors we all very well together looking at companies that are really um, using artificial intelligence in a real meaningful way and this is a pure play ai strategy um, kind of capturing that ai ecosystem for investors that want the ai exposure right and okay so so let, walk us through a little bit of that strategy how you broke down the index mm-hmm. uh, to, to really kind of capture, because obviously AI, is, it, it's all over the place now, right? It's in every industry, but how, how did you break that down to make sure it, it was more of a pure play AI yeah. uh, index? First, we dug a little bit deeper into our um, flagship fund, um, Robo Global's Robotic Automation AI Fund. And we have there are 11 subsectors within that. And the computing processing and AI subsector is one of them. And it became the biggest weighting. And uh, it also was one of the highest performing subsector. So we dug a little deeper and found out there are actually more than a dozen companies that we could actually identify as artificial intelligence. So okay. work the advisors, we said, okay, what do we define as AI? So that's machine learning, deep learning, um, NLP, natural language processing, that was very important to us, also computer vision. So we had a sort of criteria that we were looking for in terms of what type of AI capabilities are you building or using? And um, at first it was really difficult. This is not something really easy to kind of put together and identify these companies because you need to figure out what are your methodologies. The methodology that we felt really comfortable with was not just a technology aspect, but also looking at your revenue purity. So how much revenue purity do you have around artificial intelligence? And are you a builder and developer of AI, or are you just using AI? And if you're using AI, are you just using AI for one of your departments to kind of remove the manual tasks that's happening? Or are you using AI to um, go after massive revenue opportunities? Or, if, or maybe, and perhaps in some situations, with that artificial intelligence, your business will cease to exist. So we put together um, 
uh, universe of several hundreds of companies and we narrow down to 70. So we have about 70 companies right now in the index and about half of them are in the infrastructure um, category and the other half is in the applications. And the infrastructure category um, composed of companies that are building and developing artificial intelligence. Um, mm -hmm. Companies like in semiconductor and also in the data center providers um, and infrastructure software. Those are the companies that are empowering organizations to, to be able to use AI and okay. empowering the data centers. That's really, really important in having AI applications and tools to run the way it should. And then you got the other half of the index um, that are in the application side. These are all the companies that are just really leveraging AI to go after really big revenue opportunities. And that has to be, artificial intelligence has to be a very important strategy of their business. If it's not their core strategy, it has to be a very important strategy. And how we define that is to go through their investments. We looked at all of their R&D and CapEx spending. Okay. We really dug deeper into what are they spending, what kind of companies are they acquiring, and why. And who are they hiring? We went through job postings. You know, that was fun. Going through, oh, wow. <laughs> going through thousands of job posts. Who's, you know, who's the biggest recruiter of AI talent? And that's a very important um, data point. We have found that many of these companies um, building and spending your resources around AI is really a good indicator of the future revenue potential and opportunities that you might have. So those two are our biggest kind of important factors. And the other important factors are market leadership and technology leadership. So we have um, these 70 companies in 11 subsectors, and um, it just got the fund uh, just got launched uh, around mid-May. Okay. In now there must be a a because I mean AI is still I mean it's been around for a while, but it, it, it's starting to to really accelerate. But there must be a shortage of talent. Out, out there, right? How how are companies really competing and, and getting this expertise? And you mentioned all, all, all the the job openings and yeah. uh, things like that. You know, I, I would think like every company these days they're tr they're 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 trying to get more exposure to AI. Yeah, I think you're right, and I think that's been the biggest kind of hurdle to the AI adoption. We've been talking about AI for a while, the enterprise use case, and also the consumer AI. And the biggest um, adoption hurdle has been the fact that we have this shortage of AI talent. I think the large technology companies like Google and Amazon have mm -hmm. really gone into the um, university academia world and, and really t taken a lot of the talent away from the research labs. So they have now, on the flip side, those companies are getting stronger. They have the AI talent that's building an AI organization. One of the things that I really learned, not just on the technology side, was that because you just want an AI capability, you don't just hire a data scientist and hope that you have AI applications now. You need to hire uh, software engineers that actually understand the AI algorithms. Um, right languages use, whether it's Python or not. And you also have to hire a lot of project managers to initiate all that AI work. So you have to have a uh, numerous amount of people in that organization other than just a data scientist that's leading that lab. Yeah. Then you also have to have technology infrastructure to kind of maintain whatever the testing and capability that you're building. And that's very expensive. So exactly. you need really deep pocket. And you need a lot of resources. And right now, Google is sort of the number one recruiter of AI talent and followed by some of the other big giants. Like IBM, for example, has 6,000 researchers just dedicated to artificial intelligence in their Watson lab. Wow. So wow. And many other uh, companies are following their suit in having their own AI lab. But also, don't forget, you need a cloud hosting provider to help you if you're not a cloud yep. company yourself. So it's, it's quite expensive, but we are seeing that just last couple of years, um, globally, there are just about hundreds of thousands of AI data scientists and software engineer roles that are unfilled. And this is something that's probably not gonna go away anytime soon. Right, 
Now, you, one thing that you mentioned was uh, the, the vision, the machine learning vision, uh, y- using that. Uh, I, last year, when I was in Chicago, uh, there, there was an Amazon Go store there. And I, I walked in there, and they have cameras all over the, the ceilings and things like that. And all it did was just track me, and I, it was very strange. I'm just walking out with a, a bottled water. Now, so that that's uh, that that's a form of uh, artificial intelligence, or is, is that something else? Or that's definitely artificial intelligence. Um, that is um, being rolled out across the country. Uh, we have okay. about, I believe, we have about seven Amazon Go stores in New York, and which is great. Oh wow! No way. And um, it's, it's, you, need, you basically, you do need a smartphone device. Yep. Um, you scan your QR code, you go in, and um, you basically grab a sandwich. It has your account, Amazon Prime, and you could walk out with it. And the camera does follow you. It's scanning every product that you picked up. And you get yeah. an email. As soon as you walk out, you get an email, and here's what you paid for. And what's really interesting is that, you know, they recently acquired, Amazon last week acquired um, Zooks, which is a self-driving um, vehicle platform company, and they're getting into the ride-hailing business. So there's lots of rumors out there that one day we're going to have every Prime member is going to be able to go into an Amazon Go store, pick up your sandwich or lunch, and you walk out and you you, you were able to hail a uh, a Lyft, Uber type of ride, calling, you know, uh, <laughs> car. But, right. So you got everything just Amazon from, you know, when you wake up to when you go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's uh, that's uh, impressive, but also a little, <laughs> a little scary too. <laughs> but uh, let's take a quick break here, Lisa. Uh, so the markets uh, continue to remain in a strong uptrend, but remember to be very disciplined and manage your risk when considering new buys. Uh, When we return, we are going to uh, continue more of this conversation and focus more on disruptive technologies. We'll be back. I am here with Scott St. Clair. Scott's one of our senior product coaches at MarketSmith. Now, Scott, there are a ton of publicly traded stocks just on the U.S. I think it's over 5,000 stocks. Who has the time to go through all of these stocks and find the very best ones? Yeah, most people don't, right? So what you need is a tool like MarketSmith. We have decades of research on what makes a great winning stock. So we've done all the research for you. So we're going to try to highlight those specific stocks with those great data points. So if you're looking for that next great potential big winner, orange stock ideas button, you just click on it and you've got some of the main reports that we use, including the Growth 250. Yeah, and the Growth 250 is the first list list that I go through on the weekends. Yeah, it's the most popular one, but there are others. There's the Breaking Out Today, Stocks Near a Pivot, and then the Blue Dot List, right, which is very popular. It's going to show you the stocks with the best relative strength. So we've done a lot of the work for you. What you have to do is review these lists. You're going to come up with some of the best ideas in that current market environment. Perfect. Mark Smith saves you time and makes investment research that much easier. For more information, go to Investors.com slash podcast 2020. Lisa Chai is our guest on Investing with IBD, sponsored by MarketSmith. Okay, Lisa, let's uh, talk more about disruptive technologies here. And and you touched on it a little bit. Uh, let, let's talk about self-driving, because obviously this is something that everyone is getting more and more aware of. Uh, talk about what you're seeing here and, and how quickly this could even disrupt all of our worlds. I'm very excited about self-driving cars, because even though I have a driver's license, I actually don't drive. So I've been waiting to get some of these self-driving cars on the market before I learn how to repel a car. So I'm really <laughs> can't wait. Um, unfortunately, though, we're still only in level three at the moment. So level five is where it's fully autonomous, where you don't need human driving intervention. Level three, three and a half, depending on who you talk to, is where we are today. We're moving to level four, though, pretty quickly. Um, as I mentioned about Amazon, what's interesting is that uh, they have invested heavily in the last couple of years on self-driving vehicles, self-driving trucks. So last year, Amazon actually um, put an order in for 100,000 um, Rivian trucks, which is self-driving trucks. Oh, wow. So 
able to deliver packages. And they expect that to be out by next year. So for them, maybe in the self-driving truck world, we should be in level five by next year. Um, for the rest of us, though, for you and I needing a car to go to work or go to school, we're about level three and a half. Okay. Um, and, and what and and, and what, so what what is level three? What is level four? How, how do you distinguish uh, between those? Level three is where you're still driving, but you could still you feel the computer vision, a lot of the sensing technology in front of the front of the car, okay. and it helps you stay in your lane. Okay. Lots of automatic driving. Um, parking is also now Volvo cars. If you have a Volvo, it could park. You could do parallel parking for you. Wow. That's that's three, three and a half. Um, so it has it's very intelligent. It's capturing the data right now as we're driving around. So we're we're at this pilot stage. Many many um, companies are testing the pilots right now. I've been in one, and it's fascinating. It's great. Um, I was last year. I was recently in a pilot, you know, mode where. Um, I was able to get a self-driving car to go pick up my pizza and bring it over. And the trunk was open and there was my pizza. And there was no, there was no one in that car. And this was in Northern California during this pilot stage. And, and this company have logged already you know, over 5 million miles. And they've capturing a lot of data. So we are working on the technology. I think the deep learning algorithm is really getting stronger. And we have a lot of people working on this. Um, I think, though, for us to be comfortable in getting in one right now, I think of about five to ten years from now. Okay. So, but, you know, it seems like a long time, but I think it's going to come pretty soon. So it's a very exciting time. We have a lot of companies that are um, providing technology and capabilities for the self-driving industry, and I think that's going to be very exciting. So. Yeah. Point Tesla is the only one that's level four, and and you know they claim that they're they're basically not even an auto company. They're just one large computing software company, and that's probably true. So a lot of this, there's so much software component in their car. That's really whether it's everything from streaming music to actual driving, um, your brakes. It is really connected with with lots of AI embedded into their software. So, so that's exciting. And I think, you know, broader speaking, um, we are going to hear more about it probably after we see how Amazon does with their Zooks acquisition as well as their um, Rivian um, orders that they've gotten for these self-driving trucks. So that's going to be very exciting. How, how, how soon, so after this uh, Zook acquisition, how soon do you think that we would see something from Amazon? Uh, on the on on the self driving front. Yeah, I mean, what's exciting is that they acquired this company. And we all said, "Oh, this is going to be for their packages because that is their core business, right?" Their yeah, e exactly. But they came out and said they're actually um, not going to be about packages. It's going to be with a passenger in mind. So they're taking the Zooks acquisition and letting them run with it, and they're they rebranded as Amazon, uh, you know, autonomous vehicle. Um, the division. And I think it's interesting that this is a complete new direction. And I don't think any of us, any of us expected this, that they were going to go into ride hailing. Yeah. So I think for them, um, for the ride hailing business with Zooks, it's probably going to take a couple of years. I think there's going to be lots of regulation. I think, I think the platform itself, um, the company has been a stealth mode for a while. I haven't heard a lot about their capabilities. I know that they were very ambitious though. So, but I'm, but I'm sure with Amazon and their deep pockets, they will continue to make further acquisitions in the space. And, um, I think they're really indicating that they're, this is one of their, one of their core strategies going forward. Okay, perfect. Now, uh, smart devices, smart home devices, uh, these are these are more more sophisticated than we realize, right? It's so sophisticated. Um, I think you know what's really exciting is that consumers love you know they love convenience, they love innovation, and they're really driving this advancement in AI today. And I think that's what's really surprising to everyone is that usually in technology you had enterprises really driving the technology shift and changes and adoption. But in this case, it's really consumers driving it. 
And because of that, we have so many smart devices around us. And um, let's take um, Alexa, for example, with Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, Alexa in the last three years have, um, now their devices are connected with 85,000 devices around the world. And that's, yeah, and that's 10 times greater than it was three years ago. Oh, wow. And over 100,000 skills that you could do. Um, they have 100 personal products that's directly related to Alexa products. And it's become so sophisticated where before, I would say a couple years ago, your experience could have been about where um, it's a very voice command driven, whether you're talking to Siri or Google or Alexa, you said, hey, what is the weather in LA today? And, they, and you got the answer. Could you find me a sporting goods store You know, within two miles? It found you the sporting goods store. Now, it could rebook our cancel flights for us. It could rebook our restaurant reservations without us even telling them to because it knows our schedule. Wow. Um, and I think that's very exciting. Um, now uh, you got Alexa connected to iRobot's vacuum cleaner. So even when you're not home, you can tell Alexa to clean your home. So Alexa <laughs> with Roomba. And Roomba is going to clean your living room. It knows exactly the part of the living room that's dirtier than others. It's going to go take a couple of rotations around there. It's, it even knows using artificial intelligence uh, that their bin is full and it can empty the bin out by itself. Wow. So these are devices um, that's really advanced over the last few years. So I think that we have AI around us and we're using it every day and we don't even know it. Other day, I was looking at my iPhone and I saw that um, the my iPhone, basically the Apple basically put together a photo album for me over the last 12 months of my son, I didn't even know. And I thought that's amazing that it, it curated the photo album, um, changed and enhanced the color of the exposure of the picture without me even telling them to do so. So these are really smart things that we didn't even ask to do, but it's doing it for us. And it's showing you the capabilities of artificial intelligence and all the companies that are deploying it. And it's really to make our lives easier so we could use some of the time that we have, the free time we have to do more quality things, like have more summer vacations and, and create more memories, right? Right, exactly. Now let's talk about some other companies that, that are really benefiting from AI and they might not even exist without AI. You know, one is Etsy. Uh, this is a, a stock that's been doing insanely well over the last couple of months. Uh, it it kind of surprised me when you mentioned this to me before that Etsy uh, is is AI. Uh, I, I, I never even thought about it like that. Yeah, Etsy is one of the companies that would be in our application category where they're leveraging AI, but they have also their own AI people, um, software engineers and data scientists that's really creating the capabilities. They are hosting some of their capabilities on a data center that they don't currently own. So they are getting help in that sense. Um, but they have a clear AI strategy. This is a company where the CEO actually said without AI, they would not be able to compete with uh, companies like Amazon. So Etsy, um, for those that don't know very well about the companies, basically they are creating a marketplace for buyers and sellers that's making very unique and handcrafted items. And uh, they use artificial intelligence to help the merchants and the buyers um, list their products in a way that's more attractive to certain um, buyers. So if I purchase one item from Etsy, now it knows who I am and has figured out the type of things I'm looking at. It profiled me based on the items I'm looking at. If I'm looking at, let's say, items that are made with Metallica products, they know, oh, this is the kind of music she likes. Um, if I need some baby items, oh, maybe she has a family member who, who's a child. So it already put together a profile. Now the next recommendation would be other items from the buyers that are paying for that listing. So it's very well curated, it's so smart. It takes not much time at all to do one search and you're able to get the kind of items that you're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. and items that you may not even be looking for but you thought oh that actually does go well with a birthday kit that I just bought when you go into bigger e-commerce sites 
you have to go through sometimes 30,000 items to find that one perfect pillow cover. And you're like, you know what? You get tired of it. You move on. So he has done a really great job of helping the buyers and the sellers really, you know, come together in a quick way and have and make the shopping experience be really um, pleasurable. So they're also using AI for um, the shipping and payment side as well. So not just a listing, but also on the other categories of making that e-commerce purchase more to be a little bit more seamless. So this is a company I think without artificial intelligence would probably would not survive over the next five, 10 years, but because they've invested and they're investing heavily, um, investors are rewarding them for it. And they're showing that through really strong revenue growth that we've been able to see. Yeah, and, and it makes sense. I mean, if it if Etsy can really provide these products to the customers so quickly, those customers are just gonna keep coming back over and over again. And, and so it's just a, a really positive feedback cycle. Right, and that's, that's sort of the um, indication that they're seeing. So far, they really benefited from the COVID um, pandemic and that in, in, in helping um, buyers find the mass that you're looking for and finding items that you can purchase elsewhere. So people tapped into Etsy and said, wow, this experience was really good. So they're making repeat purchases. And they, they believe that this is a very sustainable momentum that they're seeing. And this is a very good classic example of a company that embraced AI from early on and took it into their core strategy, investing the right type of AI tools and applications and and we'll have you know probably see earnings and revenue growth continue to grow over the next five ten years perfect now one that uh, a company that we're probably all very familiar with but and we probably even realize that ai is being used here is netflix talk a little bit about uh what what netflix is doing use how they're using ai yeah and netflix is another example where it's a consumer company is it a media company is a technology company and they believe that they're a technology company and that they're using AI. They, Netflix is probably one of the pioneers of using AI to go after massive revenue opportunities in competing with companies like Blockbuster. So in the beginning, Netflix went through a lot of you know, transformation, how to get that customer for the movies. As soon as they started to do video stream, they realized that smart devices, home devices, mobile devices are a key to kind of capturing that customer and retaining them. So when you have your Netflix account um, and you have your page of your personalization of recommended movies, so your page and my page is very different, not because just the movies that we watch, but also the kind of actors and actresses that we like to watch. And, um, and maybe uh, some of the countries that we like to, or maybe I like to watch movies from Korea. And it's actually recommending all the movies through that. So it's learning a lot about me. So it knows the movies I like, the actors and actresses. So on the Netflix website, when you open up your page, you'll have your Lisa Chai, and you got all the movie recommend, recommendations, all the movies that everybody's watching. These are real time data. So the top five movies being watched today are real top five movies. That's incredible. That type of details is not available in other video streaming sites, but this is very real time. It's, it's, it's because of the AI capability that they've invested so heavily. And investors really punished them for that in the past. Now you're starting to see that um, they're capturing the market share, um, their subscription revenue is growing. And for me, um, it's great because my Netflix page is very personalized. It's just for me. Um, I like to watch movies with Jennifer Aniston on it. So in all the movies with Jennifer Aniston, she is the first character in that movie page when I'm looking at it. Versus if you like um, Daniel Craig, you'll have Daniel Craig on your page. So it's a very different experience. And I think that's where the world is going, is more of that personalization that if we're staying at home watching uh, videos from home rather than movie theater, we want a real personal experience. And that's what Netflix is allowing that. And it's been several years, every few quarters or so, the CEO will remind investors that without artificial intelligence, we will cease to exist because they would not be able to retain their subscribers without AI. And no, I think perfect. the example of technology companies saying, you know what, this is our future. 
and it is what it is. Let's see what technology capabilities we could adopt so we cannot just only grow, but also um, sustain our momentum and our business model. And, and so now we, we can, you know, most of the listeners will be able to relate to both Etsy and Netflix, but uh, you know, one, one area where we might not really understand how AI is tr- uh, changing everything uh, is the, the mortgage loan processing industry. Talk a, bit, a little bit about this, how AI is uh, really kind of disrupting uh, this whole industry. Yeah, so I think um, what, what some of the exciting part about my job is to really dig deeper and seeing how enterprises are using AI as we build more commercial application use cases. We're using, seeing AI and kind of the alerting frauds for banks. And with the mortgage processing, what was really interesting was that they were using, some of these companies were using AI to make the mortgage loan process quicker. So there's all these you know, 10, 20 pages of um, forms that you have to fill out over and over. You got lawyers through all these hundreds of pages and you get the, the closing documents. Now, some of these companies are using AI to actually scan some of the documents and upload the data for you. And it knows if, if a lawyer made a change, it knows exactly what the changes were. And this is sort of that document management coming back 2.0 where it's become a lot smarter, it knows exactly the data that was changed and it uploads it really quickly. And if there's a part of your form that's unclear, it's not readable because your handwriting or maybe um, the printer was bad, AI knows exactly what you were trying to write. So it knows your data, it it corrects it for you, um, and it enhances the document quality. So it's really saving time. It's accelerating kind of the, low, the mortgage loan processing. It's making um, the processing job easier. And I think a lot of the manual tasks that all the loan processors have to work on was very tedious. They weren't happy with it. Now the loan processing officer can now work on some complex cases and having some of the basic cases to, to allow AI to kind of alert and adopt and automate. So this is the type of automation that we're seeing that's really helping the enterprises cost, um, save costs and uh, improve kind of the employee turnover. Perfect. So growth investing requires identifying disruptive technologies and capitalizing on them when they are ready to change the world. Coming up next, we are going to discuss a few ideas. Stay tuned. MarketSmith will give you a huge edge in the stock market. Better stocks, bigger profits. MarketSmith is the top research platform for IBD. It's just the best tool for individual stock selection. Everything within MarketSmith is designed to bring those best stocks to the surface. It does a lot of the work for you of filtering down to the potential leaders. It's when you take the training wheels off and you're ready to invest on a more professional level. MarketSmith will help you take control of your investment life. If you want to get serious about investing, start your membership today. We are back with Lisa Chai on Investing with IBD, sponsored by MarketSmith. Okay, Lisa, let's get into a few ideas. And the first stock that we're going to talk about is NVIDIA. Uh, so what, what do you like about uh, NVIDIA? I think um, NVIDIA is probably everyone's darling. I've been yes. following the company for over 15 years. They've done a successful job of really transitioning their business model to being a uh, um, provider of chips for video game platforms to now artificial intelligence computing company. So we can't think of another semiconductor company that actually powers AI data centers like the way they do. Um, if it weren't for NVIDIA, we would not have the type of genomic sequencing um, information that we were able to have from researchers, medical diagnosis that's happening today is using NVIDIA processors. And they're still a number one provider for the video game market. So as you know, they're number one leader in GPU processors. Mm -hmm. Uh, They just came out with um, new AI chipset. So we're going through this evolution in the semiconductor world of AI accelerator cards and processing chips are coming out. And these chips are really designed to make AI capabilities faster and at a much lower cost. So their new chipset A100 
is basically 20 times faster than the previous generation Volta, which is pretty big deal. So once again, they really surprised us with this amazing announcement. And um, stock has been up over 60% year to date. It's been one of our best performing company since inception for our core flagship fund, as well as the stock is also in the index of the artificial intelligence strategy. So it's been one of the most amazing stories out there. Um, they're pretty much unbeatable in the inference and training world at the moment. Um, their number two, number three um, providers are really distant second and third. So if you're talking about AI computer processing chips, it's really NVIDIA that really dominates the market and they've, they're winning the race basically. Now, our, and, and, and so AMD, because AMD has been trying to get into this space, but they're, but NVIDIA is the clear choice uh, in the AI world? Yeah. At, at this point, yes. Um, I think there are a lot of private company startups that's coming out with some really great technology, especially in the ASICs world. But at this point, in terms of power and um, the performance power and the, the cost and also you have to be able to get into the enterprises and work with the data center and integrate into the other servers. Yeah. So right now NVIDIA has that experience. They have all the relationship. There are A100 chips already integrated with all the large supercomputers and the servers at the moment. So there aren't any partners out there, even competitors that don't want the A100 chips. So they've really done it again in terms of announcing and really innovating. Um, this next generation AI processors that we've been waiting for. So that's, I think NVIDIA is a company that we expect to see continue to grow over the next five, 10 years. They have tremendous momentum behind them at the moment. And how many verticals is, is uh, the chip being used at self? So you mentioned genomics uh, and self-driving, obviously data centers. What mm -hmm. other uh, type of verticals are, are they uh, being, being used in? Every industry. I mean, they're still number one in video game. Yeah. Uh, they are in financial institutions. So any industries that's really using that kind of um, uh, higher performance computing architecture. Yeah. And Artificial intelligence, you really need a modern architecture solution environment. So NVIDIA has a really good training chips as well as now inference. So right now, I'm not saying that there aren't competitors that's going to catch up pretty soon. But yeah. It seems like we have at least about a two-year lead at the moment. Perfect. So let's go to the second stock, and this is Twilio. And Twilio is another stock that has done uh, really, really well, especially after uh, their earnings report. Uh, what makes uh, Twilio so special? So Twilio is um, also uh, in our infrastructure subsector category for the AI index. And what's really unique is that this is a company that's really empowering software developers and business around the world um, build AI capabilities. And um, we, as I mentioned earlier about just AI adoption. Um, hitting the roadblock and the hurdles is that one of the things that enterprises really want more AI capabilities. They want to get use AI, yeah. but they don't have resources. So now you have companies like Twilio that have a very easy to deploy solution for using their API for the software developers at enterprises to kind of deploy and use and create applications. So when you're on, um, and they really focus mostly on the messaging platform. So if you're ever on Airbnb website and you're communicating by email um, with your uh, the owner of the house, what you're really using is Twilio's platform. So that platform that they've created is basically just sort of easy to deploy, easy to use um, API. So think of it as a kind of off the shelf AI application for the software developer. So if I decided at Robo Global that we need a chatbot. We will use Twilio's platform to create a chatbot and that has a lot of artificial intelligence features around it. So they're getting, they're really the solution sets using AI um, more every day and they're using lots of natural language processing. Um, and this is a company that we believe that 
will grow their top line over 40% this year. And we see that momentum continuing. Wow. And, and so, yeah, a lot of times the way I've, I've looked at Twilio is there, you, you have these huge trends like the, the AI trend and they're almost the picks and shovels mm -hmm. in that everyone <laughs> needs uh, Twilio's product uh, yeah. to, to compete these days. Right. And I think that um, giving that type of power to the enterprises, whether you're small, medium, or large, to have in-house AI experts and data scientists is really key. Yeah. And having that easy to deploy um, applications is really important because you could just sell your solution platform, but if you don't know how to work it, use it, it's really not going to be uh, functional, right? So Julio has a platform that they are making it easy for you to use that you and I could have our own AI chatbot. We could have a messaging platform using AI capabilities to read and, and route um, calls. Um, so if you if you send me an email and um, I don't know if I really have time to route that to really respond to you, totally AI capability will help me kind of prioritize your call versus the other ones. So that type of kind of capability is something relatively new that we've just seen in the last couple of years in the enterprise world. So any small businesses, whether you're small, medium, or large, I think will have the power to use Tulio's product. Perfect. So let's go to the third stock here. And this is another company that is really leveling the playing field for a lot of small and medium businesses. Uh, this is Shopify. Uh, talk about uh, the amazing things that these guys are doing. Yeah, I mean, similar to Etsy, they're really transforming the e-commerce world. Um, so with the, the shift of e-commerce taking market share from the traditional retail industry, um, Shopify have come to come out with their e-commerce platform that allows small and medium businesses to be able to sell things online. So they're not um, competing with Amazon, they're partners with Amazon. So you're just really a software platform company that's creating that marketplace. And they've, been, they've had tremendous growth because I think the demand for cloud computing solutions um, tied with e-commerce is really in high demand at the moment because um, the retail industry is still a $25 trillion industry. And it's not that we're buying less now that we're home or we're just buying less because of right. retail going out of business. We're just moving our online, sh our shopping experience to online. So you're just seeing a shift happening from physical stores to online, and Shopify is really well positioned to benefit from that trend. So the company is um, out of, based out of Canada. It's really well managed. Uh, the founders are still running the company, and they are very smart about their acquisition, the capabilities that they're building in artificial intelligence. So here's a company that's created you know, the e-commerce platform that's very easy to use, and like you said, leveling the playing field so as a small business owner, I could now compete with Amazon in selling my goods. Um, Shopify platform is used in a lot of the, um, not just retail stores, but also restaurants as well that's selling grocery items. Oh. So they're now getting into the payment side um, of the business and there are many other areas that they could expand into. So I think um, Shopify is sort of going through this multi-decade type of cycle where we expect them to um, have 30 to 40 percent of revenue growth over the next several years. Wow. And one thing that I found really interesting with Shop that Shopify has done over the last year is they got more into the, the distribution center and, and started to it's actually compete with Amazon on, on that realm. Yeah, it's true. And for them, it was uh, they are really engaging with their customers every day to see what the needs are. And they found out there were a lot of the customers were really struggling with fulfillment centers and distribution. So they decided, why don't we help them? So that's sort of, I think, that that type of initiative kind of came from speaking to their customers mm -hmm. and meeting those needs. And they found out there was a real untapped opportunity there for someone else to come in and fulfill that. So they're definitely getting to distribution. And I really like the way their strategy has been is that they, they, um, they start out a little bit smaller and see if they could do well and they expand on it. 
Um, so I think that's an area where it's going to be a pretty meaningful part of their business going forward. Um, but I would say Shopify, out of all the e-commerce companies out there, are leaders in using artificial intelligence um, capabilities. And I think we're going to see more of that. And that's going to help them sort of optimize and get lots of intelligent data. And that data that they're providing for the customers is going to be really key to winning against some of the larger retailers. Excellent. So there are a few ideas that are worth adding to your watch list. Thanks, Lisa, for joining us today. Thank you. Next week, we will have John Nigerian on the show. John is a former linebacker of the Chicago Bears, a former floor trader in the options market, and he's also the co-founder of MarketRebellion.com. So that's it for this week in Investing with IBD. I'm Arusha Pires, and thanks for listening.